Hi, my name is Sandra Romero, and I've been with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program for six years. I am the African American History Project Coordinator, as well as the transcription and audit editing trainer. Um, today, we're going to be going over audit editing, as you guys have probably already heard from me in person or video from the previous. Um, we've gone over transcription before and that fun lengthy process. So today we're going to be going into the guide of audit editing, which is the next step that comes after drafting. If you made it here, good job. We appreciate you and we accept your help wholeheartedly. Um, so yeah, Audit editing is the second stage that comes after drafting. Like I said before, the drafting lays down the foundation work of the actual text itself, of translating from oral to documentary. So the purpose afterwards is to really help clean up the transcript, prune it, um, trim it up, and make things more accurate. If you were watched the previous videos of the transcription process, then you know that um, you leave certain marks for the audit editor, like I've said before like bolded words and inaudible in brackets, for example, right here, how you see it bolded, as well as um, timestamps for things you cannot hear. I said those before for a good reason, and we're about to get into that now. For the audit editing part, your primary focus is going to be on um, listening to things that were previously misheard or not heard at all or misunderstood by the transcriptionist. So as an audit editor, like I said here, you will be targeting bolded words and phrases, as well as these mark sections that have the inaudibles, like I've mentioned before. Um, you're going to be attempting to listen to those again. At this point, if you're audit editing, you have, you've done this a couple times as far as drafting transcripts. So you've heard different people, you've heard um, different variations of accents, dialects, um, what have you. So if you're here at the audit editing stage, that means that you're able to kind of decipher a little bit more than people who may be just coming on. So um, you're attempting to prune things as far as things that may not have been heard. You're going to listen, give it a listen. If you're able to hear it because of um, whatever reason, then you're going to fill it out. That is the main goal of audit editing is just basically making it all trimmed and prim and proper before we set it on to the next. Um, the first step, obviously, is after the um, drafting is done, you're going to make a copy of the completed draft so that then you can work on it um, after the fact. So we've gone over before how to create like a formatting of the drafts. This one is a lot easier because it's already done for you by having a completed draft. So, for example, here is a draft that um, one could audit edit um, after the fact. And already, as you can see, there's a couple different things that need to be addressed and or fixed, if not many. So as an audit editor coming into this, this is what I'm given and I copy and paste it onto my desktop or whatever format that you guys have with your um, share access that you guys have. Um, then you're gonna go down. And one of the first things I do is I scroll down and I look for the bolds. I look for the, the brackets that say inaudible. And also formatting errors. You'll be quite surprised to see that there's a lot of formatting. For example, this shows that the original template that was used was incorrect or something messed up because, as we know, this will usually be on the um, opposite end of the transcript like that. So, you know, as your job as the editor is to go back and now you see it fixed. We also know, you know, there's going to be different issues as far as um, what is the fonts, the sizes, uh, just a couple other things. Things have changed as well. And you're going to go back to the style guide. Like I said, your style guide is your friend. Um, for example, like capitalizing um, racial and ethnic groups um, is something that you'll be going back for. And what I like to use um, and recommend for any audit editor is the replace tool, find and replace. It really does help cut on time for certain things that are really quick fixes. So for example, like the for um, the racial um, and ethnic groups, if I'm trying to find someone that, or like look around the whole document now that I see one was met um, incorrectly written, now it's safe to say that you wanna look through and it's gonna show you every single one and I just go down the line and replace. So um, I would definitely recommend using um, the replace feature when you are going to kind of when you're first looking at the transcript and you just want to get the little um like quick nuanced things done before you go into the listening for the stuff that was missed 
because that's what's going to take up the most of your time is listening to the things, the inaudibles, the bolds that were missed from the first transcript while simultaneously doing some research, because you'll find that this is also the research stage um, when it comes to searching up for cities that were may have been misheard. You're going to be using a lot of context clues, but we'll get into that in a moment. Um, like I said, you won't have to worry too much about formatting and style because you already have a completed transcript or a completed draft that was based on a template. But like you just saw in that older one, um, possibilities can change uh, as far as the formatting. So if you can you can help it and you're able to change it, go ahead. Um, like I said, we're doing our best now to find accurate and um, authentic depictions of what was said of the transcription. So the focus of this for you guys is to be able to um, be accurate as well as bring readability. We've mentioned before in the past that sometimes different things like filler words or um, false starts or anything like that can really hinder like the progression of the narrative. And sometimes even after the drafting stage, after instruction, that may still be missed because they really want to hold true to the authentic voice of the narrator. However, it still makes it quite hard. So in this stage, you will also find that you're going to be getting rid of the ums and the uhs. Um, it's really just trying to effectively convey the narrator's voice. So just keep an eye out for that. I've mentioned pruning before that you're going to want to cut out a lot of the um, stammering or the false starts. You'll find that even after drafting, a lot of them will be left. Like I said before, if there's around 10 false starts or 10 filler words, I would still keep two. That is a good way to, because that is still the way how the narrator speaks. So you don't have to, in this stage, you don't have to trim all of them off, but still keep just a couple sprinkled around, but not too many that makes it hard to read the transcript. Um, like a um, transcriptionist in the stage before, when they're listening to the interview, they're listening to it in pieces. They're listening to the words at a very different rate with a different mindset than any other person after the fact may read a transcript. So in for that reason, a lot of punctuation does get um, missed at the end of sentences because they're trying to identify words, they're trying to write out what they're hearing at a reasonable pace, what have you. So in this stage as well, you might find that you're going to see some punctuation marks missing at the end, a question mark or a period at the end. Even A lot of the cases will be like a very simple one-worded response from someone like, okay, or yes, no, and they might forget to put um, periods. So <clears throat> uh, because of that, again, that's something you're going to pay attention for. Like here I said that they don't, um, they skip the punctuation or they put it in places that kind of conform to how the narrator spoke because again, when it's really hard sometimes with oral history, we really want to convey how it's, the speaker is speaking, the tone and really reflect all of that um, in one through words, which is quite, an interesting task, but we do our best with it with all these different rules in place that we have. Um, and then precision. For so um, some reason, sometimes the transcriptionists, when they're transcribing at a certain rate, they may not correctly or accurately um, put certain words in correct um, formatting or phrases in sentence. So um, like adding an extra word. So example, it was really cold when the person said it was very cold. Something as simple as that actually does, can happen. So just keep an eye out and really keep an ear out. Most of all, um, this is the audit edit stage is the last stage as well that um, the audio is going to be heard. So it's very crucial and important that it stops with you guys when after the audit edit, you gave a true listen to the um, audio as simultaneously reading the transcript because then after this is going to final edit where there's no audio. So if there was any other possible things that could have been fixed, it could get lost in the next stage because no one's listening to the audio. They're just doing the last fixing as far as formatting, um, punctuation, like the actual transcript itself. So the more we can minimize, the more we can um, tackle during this audit edit stage, especially since it's the last one audio, the better. Um, and yeah, so the audit editor has an advantage that the transcriber didn't because you're able to scroll down through the transcript that's already completed. So um, that also gives context that can help decipher things later on. I don't know if any of you guys who, uh, who are in this tra um, training now who have done um, drafts, but sometimes you won't realize what a word is until three paragraphs later because you get all the context clues, then you go back. For example, as an audit editor, we get all the context clues in the beginning. So it's because of the hard work that was done by everyone who's transcribing. So because of that advantage, 
um, this phrase is um, able to help decipher things that may have been missed the first time. And it's totally okay, that is the point of it. And that's what kind of helped makes this system a well-oiled machine to keep going just because we can pick up and clean and new, um, the nuanced things here and there. Um, this is the part I was telling you about, verification of spelling for names of people, places, and organizations. In the previous training, I mentioned that for words that for specifically names, places, or things, um, or organizations, that if you do not know the word um, or you're not sure the spelling to keep it bolded. Um, for that reason, if, um, now in this stage of the audit editing, um, the audit editor is going to see these bolded words, specifically for names and places. And the read the context of the transcript and listening to the audio, um, then you are able to go, you can go on Google or whatever browser that you have and research. This is the time of the research period to kind of get as much accurate information. And you can find some of these things online. For example, if someone is talking about their school for, in Florida, let's say, for example, they're talking about a school called um, Mabane High School, you know, um, and you may not hear it that first time. For my, for example, I still like just now had a problem pronouncing it because it's been so long. But hearing it the first time, you may not know what Mabane is or Quincy or Lincolnville or Eatonville. These are different cities and different places in Florida that um, in the beginning may or may not be um, correctly interpreted if the person who's on the project hasn't heard all of it yet. But as an audit editor who has heard a lot of these, you'll at one point be very familiar. But if not, through context, especially if they're saying that, you know, we lived in Florida and they never veered. My my rule of thumb is if they never say mention any other outside states in that interview, it's good to check all these the names of the schools or cities um, and then type in Florida at the end. And then you'll find that there's different variations of um, spelling. So the research portion or the research aspect of this is very important for at least um, names of places and um, people. I would say people is easier you, or you can find names of people if they're more wide or known. Sometimes they talk about like um, certain reverends that they know that were active in different time periods or teachers or some people reference Martin Luther King Jr. Those you can do research. There are some situations where I'll say it might be hard as far as when they reference have names, we like just personal, um, intimate or um, intermediate family members that are that we are not sure how to spell their names, but you wouldn't be able to Google them as well. Then, you know, you keep those bolded which, so that we're not unbolding them and claiming them to be spelled a way that they're not. It's better to keep them bolded so that then if um, the transcript you sent down the line later to the family, they can make their corrections and let us know. But we don't want to guess on anyone's like personal family names or anything. At least that's my rule of thumb. But as far as, um, for example, like the, <clears throat> here's some, a great example. I was just about to mention pheasant then because this was a recent transcript that I was working on. Um, so for the, here's some examples of what was incorrectly heard or interpreted in the draft. So if you hear it, Pheasanton, and you're not aware of the academy in Florida, which it was one. Um, this person wrote pheasant den and in bolded. And like I said before, it doesn't have to make sense, but if you can sound it out in bold as your best guesstimate, so that's what this was. Now, if you hear in the context of how I was talking about a school and like, oh, I, I attended pheasant, pheasant den at that point, you would search up something along those lines on Google. I add in Florida, add in school, add in context until, and I actually found this one on myself. It wasn't Pheasant Den, but it was Fesden, F-E-S-D-O-N. And while searching it um, with a couple other contexts to clues, I actually found this Pheasant Den. And that's how the audit edit works. Um, you may not get it the first time, you may not get a second, but um, after, I would say after at least spending no, we don't want to spend any more than 10 minutes for possibly for a word for um, researching uh, or like looking on Google for these things because you don't want to also like you shouldn't take long for this process either. The transcription process or the drafting process is going to be the longest one. Um, <clears throat> the audit edit process should be a little bit more like half that time. So if you have an example, for example, an audio or a transcript that is about an hour long, I would say it could take you about an hour and 30 minutes to probably finish the transcript or so because you're listening 
the duration of the actual audio. And then those extra minutes are for the things that, you know, you fixed. Ideally, not too many, um, but if there are a lot that takes more time, I always recommend in your work log or wherever you write your assignments in brackets, you know, just explain as to why it was longer. For example, I write many errors or many bolds, many inaudibles, what have you. <clears throat> just explain, but that's the rule of thumb is, is usually the length of the audio plus some time for the extra stuff of the research of the inaudibles and bolds. Um, so yeah, research will be your friend Google or Firefox or what you guys use. Um, and like it says here, an internet search can often do wonders. Um, as many words or context clues that you add, like I said, it can really help bring out the results that you're looking for. Um, and then here is at mentioning when you're trying to um, correct the spelling of someone's name and they work for a company or an institution, you know, then try that first. It's just giving you a lot of options as to how to search up for specifically names because that is the more, I guess, difficult part of searching up. Um, so these are just different examples that you can look. And these are all on the style guide. I know that's part of a broken record. I've probably mentioned a million times, but it really is helpful to have this aspect also on the um, style guide. And then um, after that, that's basically it because the abstract app everything is done in the transcription part or the drafting part. But basically you guys are going to, it's going to be very important for your stage because it really just helps trim everything up and make it um, that last full step before it's, you know, sent off um, to make it as accurate as possible. Um, you'll find some very interesting um, things that are transcribed down that, you know, have been misheard and, if it weren't for you guys stepping in in that middle section, you know, though you'll you might see something like pheasant den as a final copy on your <laughs> transcript. And if you put in that extra work and if you're listening, um, you know, with your headphones and you're researching a little bit, it shouldn't um, come too hard, honestly, as well as the fact that this is um, a little bit more smooth sailing than transcription. So I think you guys um should be able to get a hang of it relatively quickly uh and if you guys as always have any questions about audit editing please let me know um like i said this, these are going to be the main things that you have it's just being able to really decipher what they're saying and ideally if you've been working on that project for a while then you might hear it automatically and some of these things might come very easy for you and above all else, I would say if there's anything after the fact that was left, even after doing research, don't be hard on yourself. Um, this happens sometimes. That's the kind of the quirk with oral history since like the ancient Greek times. I mean, no one knows the true interpretation of the Odyssey as it was transcribed. Things get <laughs> lost here and there, um, but you just do your best as you can. If there's little inaudibles here and there, um, we leave it. And sometimes the... Um, the family members or the narrator themselves might provide that information later that we can fix. But if not, we're keeping it as true as we can. And um, thank you guys for coming on this step of the transcription process. If, if you guys have been here from the original video of transcribing um, and you made it here, awesome. <laughs> I hope you have a chill time <laughs> as far as um, audit editing. And yeah, I think that is it. That is all I can teach you as far as those two um, and good luck with it. And you guys have my email as well as anyone, um, as Bob, a lot of people who are um, here like Miss Deborah or Miss Tamara as well. They, um, if you have any questions regarding that as well or resources or links, um, then I definitely think that you can add, um, go to them for that. So the best way to use the transcription software for the audit editing, whether it be start, stop, or express scribe, um, it'll be a lot easier than with the transcription. It'll be a lot less stepping on the pedal per se, because you'll be hearing a lot of it, it's already written down. So you're not trying to identify or specifically stop the audio to catch up to, you know, identify. Um, most of the pet, you'll still use the pedal because you're gonna be reading things and going through, but you'll be primarily using it during the times that you are trying to identify the bolded words and the inaudibles, because you're going to have to specifically rewind and replay the timestamped version. So if it was at like four minutes and 29 seconds um, and there's nothing like, um, and at that point you're still listening, 
then you know at four minutes and 29 seconds is already a cue for you that you're going to probably pause it and if not rewind it a couple times but other than that it's about the same you're going to keep your foot on the pedal read as you're going to find it's a lot smoother to read um going down because everything's been identified for the most part if there's a couple things here and there that you notice that are not bolds or not inaudibles that were still um like written wrong for example like the like because they're writing so fast is like h or t um reverse stuff like that you can still fix um but for the majority you're going to be using the pedal for the stuff that was unidentified Hmm. Yeah, so I would say the most common problems for audit editing are very small things that are not the bolds and are not the inaudibles, because I would say the inaudibles and bolds are things you're already expecting to look for. If you find a transcript without a single one, that must have been a four minute transcript and like it doesn't exist. So that's something that's already expected. But I look for the little things, like I mentioned before, on word finds. So um, the racial groups and ethnicities are often always lowercase. So I go and fix those first. I also look for numbers. So I will manually type in the, the numeral zero, nine, and search them up throughout the whole, because you'll find that most often everyone still kind of writes out <laughs> the numbers for a lot of um, aspects um, that are normally supposed to be phonetically written out. So those are the first two things I usually search for um, because those are things you don't first think to. You're too focused on the bolds and the inaudibles, but those at one point really do contribute to um, the overall look of the whole um, transcript. A lot of dates as well. So the numbers goes hand in hand with dates because I still see apostrophe S's for like plural time periods. Some time periods are still missing the brackets from 19, but um, yeah, I would say that's like the biggest thing. Um, and also really um, the, what is it called? The the font of the transcript. Sometimes it's still um, in Calibri. I don't know why. So I would always just um, control A and replace to Arial 12. And that's in the style guide as well, if you guys want to look. But um, those are the things that I would say are the common little stuff that you won't think about as far as audit editing until you've done it enough. And then you're like, oh, I need to go back and fix all the ones I didn't do that for. <laughs> so. Those are the common problems. No, I would say audit edit. It's probably a, like very crucial in many different aspects. So whereas the drafting portion is like the footwork and the foundation, which is crucial in itself, the audit edit is the one that really helps build the pillars of this whole project or the process that we have, because at this point, these are pe these are people who are auto editing who have heard a lot of the project terminology who have some form of um, experience now who are able to um, decipher things a little bit more and we need more people who are able to have that keen ear because while we completely appreciate the work and we you know we we thrive sort of survive on it of the uh, transcriptionists which are new interns or volunteers or new staff. Um, or even older staff who would like need a break from other things here and there. Um, that is kind of the group that's usually leading those and which is very integral. However, though, doesn't change the fact that they're also kind of new to it. And with new ears, a lot of things get missed. So audit editing, I can't stress this important enough because we get to clean up and fix, you know, a lot of these possible things that if we, if we did not have this stage would be staying on these transcripts and then sent to these families and some of these things can be easily fixed if the person like if the person has heard these terminologies several times over it's a very easy fix and knowing that it just takes one step one person to be able to implement those changes to make a much more um authentically accurate transcript as well as to honor the narrator and their story and their family as much as possible by making everything accurate is also important on um, and because this is the last stage and the last step where audio is even the whole point is oral history so this is the last step of that oral aspect so we have to honor it as much as possible in this stage because in the next one um it kind of goes into like academia style and i would like to say as far as make sure that everything else as far as the transcript and the document words not really the voice and the meaning behind them are clean so that 
not only do we have the double two prong, like sort of the narrative oral history aspect, but we also have how it can be applied to academia in that we're able to make sure it's clean cut and follows a certain format, Chicago style, you know, you know, citation, all these different things are applied as well, but we can't add that stuff onto a transcript that doesn't have that voice, that doesn't have that authenticity. And so I do think audit edit is really that last and final stage of being able to fully piece together the narrative or what was missed of it before we have it sent off. So you can find um, all the information on audit editing on the style guide, roughly around page 19. It's directly after the drafting and transcription portion that you guys probably all know so very well. So um, it's gonna be very self-explanatory, it's large guide to audit editing right here. Um, and it's around a couple pages and it lets you know just all the ins and outs of how to do it, um, examples, as well as um, different tips and how to's. I hope you have a great day and thank you for joining me on um, part two uh, of this lovely transcription series. And I hope you have a good one. Yeah, thank you.